Matt Miguez has plenty on his mind, and he's ready to share it with the world. It's time to hear the Miguez Mindset. Welcome into the Miguez Mindset podcast brought to you by Marucci Hitters House here in Lafayette. Matt Miguez here for ESPN 1037 Lafayette and 1041 Lake Charles. Uh, May is here, which means we are talking college baseball postseason, recapping the NFL draft as we prepare for the release of the 2024 NFL schedule tonight. Uh, Also, big things happening in golf. We'll get to all of that later. You can check out my episode of Over Par later today talking about the PGA Championship. But joining me to talk about college baseball, the NBA playoffs, and the NFL draft is our guy Jake Crane, host of Crane and Company every weekday on the Daily Wire. Jake, what's going on, buddy? How are you? Man, I'm doing great, Matt. Good to talk with you again. And yeah, it's uh, you know, it's always an interesting time in the sports world. But uh, right now, as we lead up to what is the greatest season of all, which we know is football season, uh, yeah, a lot going on. Now, before we dive into all of that, I have to ask, because, you know, I've been following you for a couple of years now. I I watched the show and David Cohn is a country artist now. What's that? Yeah, look, look, the man, uh, the the man's very talented in multiple aspects. You know, obviously we did the movie uh, Lady Baller, so he's he's got the acting credit and he just dropped a, uh, a new album. Uh, that's that everyone needs to go check out on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all that stuff. Uh, Dave is very talented, plays the guitar. He's got a good voice. I just uh, now I'm gonna have to do something, right? I'm gonna you have to sit down one. and write like a like a rock album or a rap album or something. I've I've, I've got to get in the lab and and catch up. Or maybe you just become a New York Times bestseller. Like that. Yeah, let's just do that. Let's just do that. Yeah, you know, I can be like some of these other guys. Just get a ghostwriter and pretend. Just yep. put the picture of me on front of the book. For sure. For sure. All right. Let's talk about the NFL draft. You know, uh, there, there were some interesting decisions uh, made by several teams. Obviously, the first couple of picks weren't really a surprise. Uh, Caleb Williams goes one to the Bears. Jane Daniels goes two to the Washington Commanders. Uh, and, and then, you know, things kind of started to to heat up a little bit. And then you get down to number eight and the Atlanta Falcons, who just signed Kirk Cousins, to a four-year, $180 million, $180 million deal with $100 million guaranteed, said, let's take a quarterback. And they draft Michael Penix eight overall. Yeah. So in I'm going to give you my two cents first, and then I want to hear yours. Um, it makes no sense to me. I, I get Kirk Cousins' injury history you know, could be a, a cause for concern, but if you were concerned about his injury history, you wouldn't have given him $100 million guaranteed. Yeah. Well, it kind of feels like it's... <laughs> It's wrong on both ends. And and anytime, you know, there's a, a saying in politics, I think Ronald Reagan said it, if you're having to explain why, you're already losing. So w- when I look at the Falcons and, and the situation they're in, I think the goal of drafting isn't just to get a really good player. It's to get the right really good player for right. where your feet are as an organization. I think Michael Penix could turn out to be a really good player. It, it's not Michael Penix's fault where he got drafted. I want to make sure and, and put that out there first. But if you're a team that is pretty much complete and maybe you were just missing that quarterback position and maybe you wanted to add depth to that quarterback position and you felt good about the offensive line, you felt good about linebacker, you felt good about the defense overall, then I can understand it. But to me, this is like buying a Lamborghini when you live in a mobile home. What are you doing? That's not what you need right now. That's not at the top of the list. It, it feels like one of those situations, and we see this all the time, where a bunch of really smart people get in a room together and talk themselves into doing something stupid. There's an adage. It's called getting too cute. So when I look at the Falcons, yes, you got a good player in Michael Penix Jr., but when you look by the time, if it all works out the way you want it to, he's going to be damn near 30 years old by the time you trot him out there. So I look at all the deficiencies in a division where if you went and got a couple players – you could legitimately elevate yourself to a point where you're almost the favorite outside of probably New Orleans to win the division. Uh, And then obviously you look at what Tampa Bay is doing, but at the end of the day, it doesn't make sense because it's obvious that it doesn't make sense. It feels like a reach. And I I just don't know how much better the Falcons got right now to build to that crescendo of passing the torch from Kirk Cousins at the quarterback position. Yeah. As a lifelong fan of the NFC South, the NFC South sucks right now. 
So it, it's one of those things where you, you're exactly right. You know, you, you beef up the offensive line, you go get a, a stud edge rusher. You're probably the favorite going into. I mean, yeah, go get a linebacker that can play. I watched you guys run around and attempt to tackle everybody last year and couldn't do it. Like you go get a quarterback yep. after giving a hundred million guaranteed to Kirk Cousins. Like it just, I, I again, I it doesn't make sense, Matt, because it it doesn't make sense. That's the best way to put it. You know, I, I kind of had the same thoughts when they drafted Bijan Robinson last year. I mean, don't get me wrong, Bijan Robinson's a generational talent, and it worked out. But the well, that before- one makes a whole hell of a lot more sense than Michael Penix does. For sure. And, and again, you know, taking I will say, you know, you say don't draft a running back that high. They say the same thing about Jameer Gibbs. But when you look at what Bijan does, Bijan's more than just a running back. Right. Just like Jameer's more than just a running back. I can put him in the slot. Hell, I can put him at Z if I have to. So there's some wiggle room there, and you needed that electric playmaker. Uh, at a spot back there. So I can understand that one to, to a certain extent. This one is just, yeah. it feels like you tried to do something that was that was against the grain to make yourself look smart, and all you did was expose how dumb the pick really was. What were your thoughts on the Saints taking Taliese Fuaga at 14 overall to beef up the offensive line? Never going to get pissed that you took a good tackle. You know, never going to be upset about that. It was a need. We all know that. You look at Derek Carr. And then, you know, getting Spencer Rattler in the fifth round, I, I thought, yeah. uh, was an absolute steal. I'm high on Spencer. I think he's come a, come a long way, uh, you know, on the mental side of it since high school, obviously, and then transferring from Oklahoma to South Carolina. But you got Kool-Aid for that second-round pick, a guy that I think is going to be a good NFL player. Was he a little bit overrated coming into the draft? I think there was a little bit of that. But but I thought the Saints did what they had to do. You get Isarim late. Uh, which I didn't think was a bad pick at all. But no, I'm never going to get upset because you got better on the edge of the line of scrimmage. Is there a team, in your opinion, that made themselves, I'm not going to say exponentially better, but you look at the way they drafted and you're like, okay, you know, they pick up one or two guys in free agency. They could be a real force compared to how they played last year. I, I think what the Lions did was really smart. Uh, I, I love that they got Terry and Arnold. I think he's a great fit. You know, speaking of Dan, uh, Bama DBs, I, I, I just feel like this is a team, you know, they've locked down, uh, you know, uh, uh, Amon Ra. They locked down Panay Sewell. They locked down Jared Goff. They threw that Ukraine money at Jared Goff. But you've got to get better on the defensive side, and you're bringing in young talent that I think will blend in with the culture that Dan Campbell's cultivating there in Detroit, which, you know, culture is a cliche word that gets thrown around, but it is unbelievably value. It's one of the yep. valuable. It's one of the three pillars of winning. So I think the Lions, and and on top of that, I thought Detroit put on a great show for the NFL draft. I thought aesthetically it was great. I thought them bringing out the old legends was great. Just yep. the whole way they went about it. I think it was a big win, not just from a draft pick standpoint, but from an overall standpoint for the city of Detroit. What are your thoughts about what your Titans did in the NFL draft? Again, I, I get it. You know, I, I I think, you know, I'm never going to get mad at you for getting better up front. That They're going all in on Will Levis. You look at the wide receiver core, some of the moves that they've made. I, I think the Titans are going to be competitive. I'm very interested to see how Callahan does early. It's going to come down to whether Will Levis can protect the ball or not. Then obviously the depth on the defensive side. But I thought the Titans elevated themselves. I, I think they helped themselves. They didn't hurt themselves. But, you know, we all know at some point the Titans are going to blow it anyway. So I'm just going to get myself excited for no reason. Does Traylon Burks? get traded this summer i think there's a decent possibility of it now that they have some other pieces at wide receiver what i'm hoping happens is that Traylon sees that competition and it elevates him yep. to the point where people thought he was going to be coming out of arkansas because i do think there is a lot of potential there he's a big bodied guy he's got huge hands he's just got to become a, a more refined receiver you can't just go out there and big boy everybody even the aj browns the julio jones the aj greens the bigger longer guys you got to be a good route runner you got to have high iq you can't just go out there and out athlete anybody you ain't tyreek hill for sure for sure now let's shift to the nba playoffs you know look coming into the playoffs the boston celtics seem to be the clear-cut favorite and so far, it seems like they're playing that way. Uh, Cleveland tried to punch him in the mouth the other night without Donovan Mitchell. Uh, fell a little short. They're now down 3-1 in that series. Uh, who else are you keeping an eye on, especially in the Western Conference, as the competition for the Celtics? Well, I mean, look, it's it, it's hard not to sit here and say it's it's going to be the Celtics and the Nuggets. I mean, especially after you see what Denver did going down 0-2, losing those two games at home. It's almost like... The Nuggets got to the point where they just wanted to lose a couple just to feel something again because of the way that they've been dominating so much. Right. And then, you know, they just flipped the switch after getting bullied 
by Minnesota the first two games. They've absolutely set the tone. And, I mean, Jokic the other night was just – I mean, he's incredible regardless, but you put up those numbers, no turnovers. Um, it, they're a complete – they truly are a team. It's not just Jokic. But when I look at the Celtics, I'm looking at the rest of the East, and I think the Knicks series is probably going seven, and the Knicks will come out. But, I mean, they're the walking wounded right now. And even with the Knicks at full strength, I, it just feels like the Celtics are the best team in the East. I know everybody's waiting on Jason Tatum to let him down, but you know it, 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 they consider it. You know, we heard the same thing about Kirby Smart not being able to get past Alabama. We heard the same thing about Jim Harbaugh not being able to get past Ohio State. You can't do it until you do it. And I think this is a year that even without Porzingis, and that's a big piece because yep. if they do get to the Nuggets, what do you do with Jokic? Like right. what you you gonna put Al Horford on him? Good luck. You can put Cornette on him so he can point and laugh. I mean, that matchup was one at birth. So if you're the Celtics, obviously you got to take it one game at a time. To be honest with you, you just got to start playing better in game two. That seems to be the bugaboo for the Celtics, and they're going to get all game twos at home. But we are heading for a Boston-Denver matchup, and I think it's going to be fascinating. But Porzingis' health is paramount in the Celtics being able to to do things in the front court that they can't that they necessarily can't do without them. If you're the Pelicans who, you know, looked like they were having a really good year down the stretch, uh they were top 4 in the West at one point this season and then you you backslide into the play-in, Zion gets hurt in the play-in, um and then you end up getting manhandled uh, by the Oklahoma City Thunder in the first round of the playoffs this offseason. Uh, there, there's some there's some questions that need to be answered for the Pelicans. Do they trade Brandon Ingram? And then the other question I have for you is uh, the Th- Los Angeles Lakers still owe the Pelicans one more first rounder. And the Pelicans can take it either this year at 17 overall or defer it to next year. If you're the Pelicans, do you take this year's pick and draft Bronny with the hopes that you get LeBron for a year. Look, I, I, here's where I'm at with the Pelicans. And and we talked about this the other day on Cranic Company. I think the only way I'm taking LeBron and Bronny, that combination, is if I'm a team like Detroit or the Wizards. Like, I'm at rock bottom. I have no hope. I've got to do something. I mean, it's a Jackie Moon situation. Like, do I got to right. fight a bear at halftime to be able to get people to show up? Uh I don't think the Pelicans need to draft Bronny and get LeBron. I, I think that would set them back even further, to be honest with you. And some people shake their head at that. That's okay. Uh, I, I think LeBron can be somewhat of a home wrecker. I'm more worried about what I've been worried about this whole time. Nobody is doubting Zion Williamson's ability. I am doubting his availability. You gave a guy a max contract that gets hurt, that gets hurt and has a track record of getting hurt in the biggest moments when you need him the most. I watched him do it at Duke. I've watched him do it in the NBA. So at some point, and I know you're kind of stuck in it, Zion's got to stay healthy when it matters. Like, it just, it is what it is, dog. I know you're not out there getting hurt on purpose or trying to get hurt, but I feel like there is a little bit of a lack of toughness there. And that's followed Zion throughout his career. I mean, if we're going to be honest, the Pels were kind of rolling without him. when they didn't have, and it's nice that he goes in there and drops 40 every now and then that's fantastic. And he's a really good player, but you can't count on him when you need him the most. And if I'm going to max, I would rather max out a guy that goes and balls during the postseason and wins championships than a guy that's just a regular season. Sally, that's what he is right now. And he didn't even play most of the regular season. If we're going to be honest, if Pell's fans are, and I know well, that hurts. I well, mean, let's, uh, he, where he, am played, I? he played 70 games this year. Okay, which one? Which ones did he play when it mattered the most? Like, I would rather you that, load man. That's a good point. Like, again, I don't want, <laughs> I don't want you just to be good in the regular season. I'm paying right. you max money, max money. Like, I need you putting in work when the work matters the most. So, again, I hope the Pelicans do well. I'm rooting. I'm rooting for them. Are you going to have to make some moves now that you're stuck with Zion? I mean, yeah, that's oh. that's kind of the corner that you're in. So at this point, yes. And then you look at the Thunder. I mean, hell, they're so young, they don't even know what they're doing, and they're balling. Mm-hmm. They're but youngest team to win 55 plus games, youngest team to win a playoff series, young youngest team to sweep a playoff series, youngest team to be a number one seed. Their coach is like 13 years old. Like they've got it figured out. The Pell's got to figure it out. Go to college baseball now, postseason, getting ready to get underway, final week of the regular season this weekend, and then you go to conference tournaments. As it stands right now, who are the teams that you're looking at to make a really deep run 
uh, into the postseason and potentially to Omaha. Well, you know, it's it's hard not to just look at every SEC team that doesn't line up <laughs> with each other at a super regional and be like them. Look, Texas A and M. You know, I know it's kind of fallen off a little bit here lately. Uh, they're a team that I still think is going to make a run. I have Arkansas winning it all. Uh, I think Arkansas is going to yeah. win it all this year. But I mean, look, LSU. You know, you get hot at the right time with that roster. I know. I believe they got a sweep Ole Miss. They're saying to be able Correct. to get in right now or something like that, or or make a run um in hoover some sort of combination of the two if they can win two out of three against Ole miss which in all reality they should but you feel like it's going to come out of the sec outside of that there's always that sneaky team right like what southern miss going to do like somebody's going to make a run but i'm going to pick arkansas to, to win it right now i think it's going to be a team out of the sec and wouldn't be shocked if we saw an all sec best of three in the uh, college world series and then you look at softball I feel like Oklahoma is more dangerous right now than they've ever been because they're not the predominant number one. They're not the favorite, they're right? One, they're not the favorite, like, and they're still really, really good. I mean, they lost six games. They were barely the number two overall seed to Texas. Oh, by the way, who both of those teams are coming to the SEC. So good luck with that. So I, I think Oklahoma's pissed off. Patty Gasso uh, is tremendous what she's done. I think women's college softball at that level is the most entertaining women's sport that there is, even with what happened in women's college basketball here this past year with Caitlin Clark and South Carolina and Angel Reese and LSU and all that. But uh, no, look, it's Oklahoma till it's not. But Florida as well. I mean, you look at Florida, another perennial power. I would not be shocked if they made a run and found a way to win it. So going back to baseball real fast, I, you know, I got to give you hell. Uh, the Louisiana Rage and Cajuns hosting the South Alabama Jaguars this weekend in the regular season finale. Uh, if the Cajuns win one game, they clinched the regular season Sunbelt title and are going to be dogpiling at home. What are your thoughts on that? They're going to do it. They're going to do it. And I hope South Alabama wins two out of three. Uh, the funny thing is I've always, for some reason, I don't know why, I've always kind of had a soft spot for uh, Louisiana Lafayette, which I, I will not call them. That's what I called them growing up. That's what they were when I was at South. That's what I'm calling them. Sorry. Uh, you can write me a letter or something to deal with it. Um, <laughs> but no, they'll win it. Uh, again, when you look at, at, you know, Sunbelt Baseball, I think, is one of the – and we saw Coastal Carolina, what they did yep. you know, a, a couple years ago. Sunbelt Baseball is so competitive, and I know that any, you know, quote-unquote power four school that sees a Sunbelt school in their regional gives them a little bit of a chill down their spine because they know, number one, these guys are good, and number two, they're definitely not scared. So uh, I think Lafayette clinches it this week, but give me the Jags two out of three, Matty. I love that. All right. One more question for you. PGA Championship this weekend at Valhalla. Uh, I saw a statistic yesterday. So in 2014, Rory McIlroy broke up with his girlfriend. The same week that he won the PGA Championship at Valhalla. Mm. Fast forward 10 years later, Rory McIlroy files for divorce. The same week that he's set to play in the PGA Championship at Valhalla. Does Rory McIlroy win the PGA Championship again this weekend? Well, no, because unfortunately he has to play against Scotty Scheffler, Scheffler, who right now is just painting yep. pretty pictures out there with golf clubs and golf balls. And of course, he's the favorite, and he should be. But I do think if we're going to talk about Rory, breaking up with the girlfriend and getting a divorce, those are two different situations. Two different, for sure. I, I break up with the girlfriend. I don't owe you nothing. I owe you no Diddly squat. Thanks for the memories. It's a fallout boy song. Divorce now. Hey. We got the kids. It's a custody situation. I got to pay you alimony. It never goes away. So it's not like the freedom of, hey, guys, I just broke up with my girlfriend at Coachella. So like right. now we're just going to go out and just throw a rager. I'm going to go out here and just shoot 63 because who cares? No problems, right? I'm rich. I'm single. The DMs are popping. Now you're like, God, I'm money. wonder what my lawyer's going to say. Like I need to make sure that – you know, the house is clean in case, the, you know, for the custody battle, whatever. I think there's a lot more going on. And plus, I'm going to be honest with you, I just don't like Rory. I just don't like him. I, I don't think I'd like you. And regardless of, you know, it's almost like on Step Brothers when he's like, I don't know what it is about your face, but I just just <laughs> don't like it. I just don't like Rory. Is it is it possible that that is one of the best movie lines ever? Oh, with without a doubt. Yeah, it's just I just want to punch it. Like, and there's nothing that you can do to fix it. It just, it is how it is. It, it, it's that and keep your hands off my drum set. Yeah, don't touch it. Don't don't touch my drum set. Jake Crane, host of Crane & Company, every weekday, 6.30 to 8 
on the daily wire jake let our uh, let our listeners know where they can find you yeah definitely well uh it's easy go to youtube apple Podcasts, or spotify it's crane and company c-r-a-i-n-n company and starting this next monday so when i look at the calendar because i'm not smart enough to do the math in my head so the, on the 20th we are going to start going live at 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern. We have live chat, live calls. We're really excited about that new time slot. So, yeah, college football, college baseball. Hell, if there's Quidditch on, we're probably betting on it and talking about it at some point. So uh, come hang out with us. Jake Crane, appreciate you, buddy. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel at ESPN Southwest Louisiana. Follow us on social media at ESPN underscore SWLA. As always, thanks to Marucci Hitters House for bringing you the Migas Mindset each and every week. And we'll be back next week to talk conference tournaments and baseball and talking about the PGA Championship fallout here on the Migas Mindset on ESPN 1037 Lafayette and 1041 Charles. Charleston.